Revelation 4.11. This is uh, one of the many songs and proclamations that God's mob and the universe will sing forever. And so it's a bookend to the stuff that we see at the start of God's word. And they're both the same. Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honour and power because you have created all things and because of your will they exist and were created. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, I'm going to start with something that I know uh, because when I opened this book, and it's a terrific book, they actually started with something that I really can't speak of with any authority. They started with building a house. I know nothing about building a house, but I do know a lot about running, and uh, the images are the same. Uh, If you build a house, you need a foundation. If you're going to be a runner, you need a base. Uh, That's what they talk about in training programs, Uh, and a base is very simple. It's logging as many kilometres as you can. It's laying down a solid foundation for everything that follows. You can't be fast without a base. You can't do hard efforts without a base. You're not going to run a marathon without a base. The base is crucial, and it establishes everything you'll ever do as a runner. And as a runner, that base creates muscle memory, creates muscle strength, creates the ability to keep on going. Every day as a runner, you'll sink roots further into your base, into the kilometres that you've logged. Without a base, you get injured, you get tired, and you flame out. The base is crucial. Now, you can see how that can be applied to a house with its foundation, can't you? You need a base, you need a foundation, and as God's mob, we've got to get it straight. The base matters. It's where you start, it's how you keep going, and it's what we want to share. And the base for God's people is the gospel. Over the next six weeks, we're going to learn it together so we have that foundation as God's mob. Let me pray, and then we're going to start looking at it together. Dear God, thanks for your word. Uh, Thanks for its goodness. Uh, Thanks for its accessibility. Thanks for being able to sit here and uh, read it and hear it and talk about it. Uh, Father, we come this morning with lots of busyness and lots in the week ahead. Uh, Father, there is a temptation at this point to uh, be apathetic, to think that we've heard this before. Uh, But, Father, the base of the good news of Jesus Christ is the foundation of everything we are, the sustenance, the good news to share. Father, help us to hear it. Help us to delight in it. Help us to learn it. Please lay in us a solid base as your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Over the next six weeks, like I said, we're going to lay this base again, learn the gospel, and this book is available for anyone who'd like to grab a copy. Uh, We're going to do it by reading this book, but more importantly, we're going to do it by diving into God's Word. God's Word is His revelation of who He is, and as we look at that, we're going to summarise it in six pictures with six verses, Uh, and that'll be something we can take with us wherever we go, to which we can return on any day. I have point two on the other, but before we go any further, uh, it's worth asking why would we do it? Uh, a lot of kids have started school this week. Uh, kindergarten's kicked off. Uh, people don't stay in kindergarten for all of their schooling. You do kindergarten, then you move on. A lot of people look at God's word like that, the good news of Jesus Christ. I've done the gospel, I'm going on. I've done the gospel, I've done the basics, what's next? Now, before we answer that question, let's get straight what the word gospel means. Uh, The word gospel is the announcement of great, momentous, life-changing news. Uh, Christians didn't come up with this word. Like a lot of words, they borrowed it from the culture around them. Rome, the kingdom of the day, the greatest empire of the world, often sent out gospels. Let me give you an example. Marcus Aurelius and his wife have had a new son. His name's Tom. And he's going to be the new emperor of all of Rome. That's a gospel. Uh, It's momentous news. There's a new heir. It's sent out to everyone. And whether you like it or not, you've got to adjust your life. Because Tom's going to be emperor. And so you've got to work out what you're going to do with it. That's a gospel. And it's a word used in the accounts about Jesus. It's a word he uses himself. 
and the community of the people he creates. There's a really classic statement that we've done a number of times from a letter Paul wrote to a church in Corinth. Now, brothers, I want to clarify for you the gospel I proclaim to you. You received it and have taken your stand on it. You're also saved by it if you hold to the message I proclaim to you, unless you believe to no purpose. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, that he appeared to Kephas, Peter, and then to the twelfth. Uh, It's one of the most famous summaries of the gospel. Uh, I want us to notice a number of things about it. Uh, It's a body of truth. It's learned, proclaimed, and received. Did did you see how Paul talks about it being received by him? How he learnt it there in verse 3, and then he passed it on. Uh, I'm excited about the rugby league season. Uh, It's coming up. Finally, hopefully, God willing, Parramatta will win the premiership. Uh, and as they do, you will marvel in the way the Parramatta backline works. The ball comes, and it comes to the halfback, and he passes it to the 5'8", he passes it to the centre, who passes it to the fullback, who passes it to the wing. Uh, they just pass that ball along. That's the image. It's something they receive and they pass on. Uh, I want you to notice, too, that when they pass that ball, they don't change it. It doesn't start as a football and then become a basketball and then a tennis ball and then a cricket ball and then a shuttlecock. It's the same ball, isn't it? doesn't change. It just gets passed along. And when Paul does that, he not only receives it, he listens to it, he then speaks it, proclaims it. The gospel is news that is spoken, first and foremost. You don't catch the gospel by watching how someone behaves. You don't understand the gospel by looking at people's good deeds. You hear the gospel. It's a body of truth that's spoken, a message that is passed on that others can listen to. It's a statement about a person. It's a statement about a king. And the person and the good news are inseparable. That's what the word Christ means. Jesus the King. Uh, It's a message about what that King did. He lived, he died, he rose for our sins. And and it's not in a vacuum. It doesn't suddenly emerge. It's according to the Scriptures. It's about a King, Jesus, God's promised King for the whole world, who was planned for from God's Word, who died, was buried, rose for our sins according to the Scriptures. Remember those five fingers that we've often used? Jesus Christ died, was buried, rose for our sins according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel, the good news that is heard and passed on. I want you to notice a couple of other things about the gospel. I want you to notice that it is something that saves people. Do you you see it there in verse 2? You are also saved by it. This message confronts our natures. It says to us that we are people who have a desperate need. We might not look like it. We might not feel like it. We might not exhibit it in our community, but we are people who have a desperate need and need to be saved. Uh, It it isn't just about salvation, if I can use the word just there. Uh, It's actually about sustaining. And you see there up in verse 1 that they don't just receive it and are saved by it, they then take their stand on it. It's the foundation for the rest of their lives. They don't move from it. In fact, in another letter, in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 to 7, they sink their roots deep into that soil. They don't move from it, but they learn it and appreciate it and deepen in it and love it and delight in it more and more. It saves, it sustains, and it's shared. Do you notice that we have an example here about the gospel not being locked up in a mob and kept tight because we don't want to get dirty by the world or passed on? It's actually something that gets shared around, spoken to others, uh, so they can hear it and have the same understanding. The gospel saves, sustains, and it's shared. So, So why are we learning the gospel? For those reasons. It saves us, it sustains us, 
and it's the best news that Narrabri could ever hear. And we want to take it out. So we're going to learn it. And we're going to learn the first box of those six boxes. And we're going to, I'm at point three on the outline. Are we going to learn, and we've got to go right back to the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the backdrop for the momentous good news. God made everything, the heavens and the earth. How did he make them? He spoke. He said, light, and there was light. He said, fish, and all those fish emerged. He said, trees, and there were trees. Again and again, right throughout that creation account in Genesis 1, Verse 10, verse 12, verse 18, verse 25, God gives an assessment every time. What's God's assessment every time? It is, it's good. It's grand. It's sensational. And the climax of his creative effort are human beings. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They'll rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the animals, all the earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created them in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. And God also said, look, I've given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth, every tree whose fruit contains seed. These will be food for you, for all the wildlife of the earth, for every every bird of the sky, for every creature that crawls on the earth, everything having the breath of life in it. I've given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Evening came, and then morning, the sixth day. Now, we've touched on that verse a number of times about creation of male and female, haven't we? We've touched on it as we looked at God and sex last year. We touched on it over the summer holidays as we looked at God, his trinity. God made humans, male and female, equal but different. He made them in his image. He put them in the garden and he gave them everything they knew. Do you notice that the other verse we're learning, Revelation 4.11, is the bookend to that at the other end of the Bible. That's the two grand bookends about God. You're worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things. By your will they were created and have their being. Before we apply this at the the end, let me just make a couple of observations that come out of this. Uh, First, there is nothing that God didn't create. That's a worthwhile thought this week, isn't it? God created all things. Uh, Do you notice that when God made all things, he made it good, very good. Uh, We see it cracked. We see it broken. We see it damaged. When God made it, it is very good in its substance and purpose. A third, you want to notice that God is the creator who's separate from his creation. He's the one who made it. That means he has a certain place in all of creation. And as the one who made it, do you notice that he's not negligent? He didn't kind of create Adam and Eve and say, off you go and see how you're managing this. Well, do you notice he then sat them down and showed them the smorgasbord for their food? I've given you all of this. <laughs> all of this. He gives them very clear instructions and he gives them very generous provision. And those humans, fourthly, are made by God and in God's image. They bear that image, fifthly, as people who rule the world. Do you notice that's in God's deliberation there at the start? Let us make man in our image so that they can go and do this. And then when you get to Genesis 2, verses 15 through 17, God puts them in a garden. He gives them very clear instructions about how to tend that garden. So I hope we notice there is a very clear order in creation. That's why that picture works in a certain way. Crown, humans, the world. God made the world. He made everything in it and he made us to tend the world under him. So there's something both marvellous and common about humans. We're common with the rest of the world, aren't we? Because we're created. 
we created. But we're different to the rest of the world because we're given the image of God and very clear instructions from him about how to tend his garden. Uh, That means we've got a relationship with God. Uh, A poem uh, in the Old Testament, Psalm 33, describes it like this. Let the whole earth tremble before the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world, I think it's talking about us there, stand in awe of him. For he spoke, he came into being. He commanded, he came into existence. Be in awe of God. Listen to him, obey him, honour him. He is the creator and he's given us a job to do. Now, if we were going to summarise that, it would be very similar to what I gave the kids. This is basically what we want to learn so that we've got a, a picture, a Bible verse or a summary dot points. You can, you can sketch this and I've done it on the back of a beer coaster. You can share the good news of Jesus that way. That verse, that picture, God made the world. He made the world good. He made us in his image to rule the world by listening to him, obeying him and responding rightly to him. Now, one of the most striking things about that is that it confronts our world. I'm at point four on the outline. It confronts our world. It deals with many of the deeply held views that we have as humans. I think that's one of the really terrific things about this book. Every chapter finishes with, here's where this box confronts the world. Here's where this box confronts the world. The first way it confronts the world is by dealing with something called materialism. Uh, Let me read the definition for materialism because it sounds flash. It isn't that flash. Materialism is the view that physical matter is the only thing that exists. There's nothing else in the world except atoms and molecules, no God who made it. We're simply here because we're here. Everything that exists has randomly or accidentally formed itself in its current state of complexity and order. No no creator, no ruler, therefore no purpose, rhyme or reason. Uh, Now that's a, a kind of broad brush picture, but behind that is a certain view in our community, as these people point out, that says... Uh, here is a world full of matter, things you can poke, measure, pinch, touch, taste. It's all random. It's all that's here. And the only way we're ever going to explain it is by doing more and more science experiments. That's, that's the world we live in. And so when you die, you become worm food and off we go in that great Lion King circle of life. Uh, you can see the consequences, can't you? Uh, If that's all there is, then no one is ever accountable. There's no morality, there's no reason, there's no purpose, and there's just this endless... There's still a God. And the God that our world has made has been us doing this thing called science. That's this distilled down to its really rough outline. And so there's no reassurance about your purpose. There's no explanation for those emotions. There's no understanding of why you'd form a relationship. There's no explanation for gatherings called community. But if you have a creator and a creation, then the matter matters. And it matters because it's there for a reason. Uh, Secondly, uh, this box confronts something called mysticism. Mysticism is almost the opposite of materialism. It believes that the non-physical world, the spiritual world, is the real world, the important world. The physical world, that's just evil, immoral, unspiritual, unimportant. So it creates a division, doesn't it? Uh, And you hear this often in interviews. I'm a really spiritual person. No one ever tells you that they're a real physical person, do they? I'm a real spiritual person. Because the spiritual is what matters, and you don't want to mix those two. Because that physical stuff will make the spiritual stuff, which is pure and what life's about, it'll make it really dirty. In fact, that physical stuff's just a hindrance, or that physical stuff doesn't matter, so I can just play around at it as much as I want. But the reality is that when God made the world, he made it good and combined, didn't he? So that both the material and the mystical, both the physical and the spiritual are actually inseparable. And the physical sensations and experiences interact with our souls and vice versa. And both are good, albeit damaged, 
both are good. Uh, thirdly, it confronts something called deism. The third alternative suggests that the world is a machine that runs on its own. Uh, it may have been originally made or set up by God, but it doesn't have any significant ongoing involvement. That's the default of many people today. So that they don't believe in God at all, they just don't see God as having any real role, work, relevance or interest. I want to suggest that I think this is probably more common in rural areas. It's very rare to meet someone in a rural area who says there isn't something bigger, even if it is a drought or a fire or a flood. But it's still a view that keeps God over there. He made the world and then he walked off and now I've got to conquer the world. He made the world and it's so damaged he's not interested or even worse, he made the world and it's so damaged he can't do anything about it. And so you end up viewing God as something like a cosmic vending machine where you go to and hopefully he'll reveal something or a cosmic emergency service <laughs> who you call when things are really grim. But God's word is very clear. God created all things and they have their being because of him. He sustains it daily. So this first box confronts those three ideas our world holds, materialism, mysticism, deism. But what it does do, because we inevitably ask this question, and what it does do is it raises a very important question. If God made the world very good, and he made us to rule the world under him so that the garden flourishes by listening to him. What happened? Why is that not the world I live in today? And we're going to look at that next week. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you for your clarity. I thank you for your revelation. Father, you've done more than give us a handbook or a text, a checklist or, or a manual here. You've actually revealed your nature uh, and that is delightful. delightful. Father, I thank you that you are the creator and that we are the created, that we're made in your image in a good world and thank you that you speak clearly to us and we stand in awe of you in right relationship as you've made us to rule the world as you desire. Father, thank you that that was your creation intent. Father, it does raise a really pointed question. It's a, it's a question we deal with daily. And so, Father, we pray that this week, as we know that goodness of your design, help us to ponder the world we live in now and what has happened and why it's taken place. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.